if you took a piece of wood, put it at a 45 degree angle, took a ketchup bottle and squeezed ketchup out of it at the top of that piece of wood, yeah. the ketchup stuck to the wood would be going slow. The ketchup farthest away from the wood would be rolling pretty fast. That's a boundary layer of ketchup. <laughs> this image of a guy with a ketchup bottle and a two by four doing a thing that literally no human in the history of time has ever done. I'm like, now I need some ketchup. Right. I need a giant piece of wood. I need it. That makes total sense. So somebody said, why don't we make the floor of the wind tunnel move? And they went, how would we do that? Ketchup, obviously. <laughs> yeah. No ketchup involved. <laughs> a lot of money. Hi, I'm Sam. We make this show because we like it, but also because it keeps our young producer, Mike, off the street and away from a life of crime. If you want to help both of those things happen, you're luck. We have this thing called Patreon. For a few bucks a month, you get to help support the show, but you also get some neat perks like monthly bonus episodes. The money we raise through Patreon helps keep this show on the air. If you like what you're getting here and want to help us keep doing it, that'd be great. If not, that's fine too. We like you anyway. You're here. We're glad. Join at patreon.com forward slash not the car. Back to the show. Welcome to It's Not the Car. I'm Sam Smith. I'm one of your hosts. I'm a journalist and a club racer, and I drink a lot of coffee. Jeff, who are you? Go. I am Jeff Brown. I'm a longtime race engineer in sports car, indie car, all sorts of stuff, and currently technical director at, uh, well, I should say competition director, more uh, precisely at AWA running the um, Corvettes in the IMSA series this year. And so um, get to use my engineering uh, experience and try to try to win some GTD races with the Corvettes. Okay. So Jeff is one of the hosts. I'm one of the hosts. And we have a third host. His name is Ross. He's not here this week. He says he's busy with work, but he also owns an old Lotus, which means he's off fixing his own Lotus. And that's what you, mainly because that's what you do when you have an old Lotus and, or any car really where it's binary between fun and pain and there's nothing in between. But today, today we're doing something that I love and I love everything we do in the show, but I like this one in particular because I'm a sucker for asking questions and Jeff has a lot of answers. Yeah. Today's format is something we call Jeff teaches Sam a thing. And that thing, as I have it written on the Google sheet where we keep track of show taping topics is, and I quote, because I am a giant dork, it says, prithee, how doth one wind tunnel? Again, I'm sorry, I'm a dork, but basically, what is wind tunnel? How does one wind tunnel? Who is wind tunnel? Where is wind tunnel? When is wind tunnel? So I prepped for this through a, a whole career of reading and talking to aerodynamics people and racing and being dorky about it, but also recently sat down and reread a book that Jeff wrote with a pretty talented journalist named Paul Haney in the 1990s. It's called Inside Racing Technology. It's a really interesting book. You should check it out. It is, as Jeff pointed out to me, old because it was written then. Racing stuff changes every year. Technology ever marches forward. My iPhone now is a year old. It feels very old, yada, yada, yada. But the fundamentals of this stuff still apply. And there's some great background interviews in it. It's basically deconstructions of the principles at work in the sport through the lens of the people that deal with them, from NASCAR all the way up to F1, and interviews with everybody from Carol Smith to aerodynamicists on F1 teams, things like that. Also, odd super dorky note he ends up talking to a funky old hero of mine a guy named lee dykstra the guy behind the group 44 jaguar gdp cars he founded decon he was once indycar's tech chief and yada 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 anyway so we're gonna kick this off and i'm gonna stop talking and i'm gonna ask you a question that first question we're gonna go hyper basic with this is why do we put cars in wind tunnels what's what's the point jeff yep yeah, it's that's that seems like a basic question, but you could make the whole show out of just answering that. The real reason is <laughs> when, when aerodynamics came into racing and, you know, it's like, oh, we, when aerodynamics were invented, well, they've always been there. It's, it's fluid <laughs> dynamics. It's aerodynamics. Made air you know. today. Yeah. Right. Nobody decided that, you know, we're going to invent air flowing over a vehicle. It's always happened since the very first one, air has flowed over a vehicle. Nobody cared until they got going fast and somebody decided that you could maybe make more grip by pushing them down on the ground somehow by taking an airplane wing and tipping it upside down. If it lifts the airplane off the ground, maybe it would push, if we did it with, turn the airplane wing upside down, maybe it would push the race car into the ground and make the tires grip harder. 
So we had, we had downforce, which is what that simply is. The penalty, the, the price you pay for downforce is drag. So we were pushing the cars down into the ground harder. They go around the corners faster. But because of that, they were going slower down the straights. So we wanted to learn how that works exactly. How changing a wing shape or uh, the angles of the wings or the body shape of the car could affect the drag and the downforce. Because what you would like is lots of downforce pushing the tires into the ground and no drag to slow it down. But how do you measure that? So they've been doing that for, I don't know, 50 years more with airplanes. They had wind tunnels, which basically they took an airplane, model of an airplane, stuck it in this big tube with giant fans on the other end, and they blew air at the airplane. And they put rudimentary scales to measure how much force lifted the airplane model up when you blew this air over it, and how much force was pushing back on the airplane, which was drag. So they were measuring, they called it lift, because airplane people want to lift their car off the ground. Race car people call it either downforce or negative lift, which is down. But yeah, the airplane people had these great wind tunnels and they used them, you know, skunk works. They de designed um, all sorts of very, very fast, high performance aircraft by using a wind tunnel to get everything right before they went and built this big plane. The race car guys went, wow, we want to measure the same thing, just kind of opposite. So they said, can we borrow those? Can we borrow one of those? And they said, sure. And they went, okay, well, they normally mounted the airplane in the middle of this tube, this giant tube. They'd mount the airplane in the middle of it off some stalks or stingers or barbs or whatever. <clears throat> and we said, well, we don't do that. We don't fly in the air. So we'll just put it on the floor of your wind tunnel tube and measure it. And they attached some scales and some scales underneath the tires and they blew the air and the air went over the car and it pushed it down. And it also had some drag component that they could measure. So just one, one moment of context, right? So when did, so, you know, air, obviously air has always been around, but mostly for the most part, downforce didn't start to be applied effectively and, and understood on any level in motorsport until generally the late 60s, right? You know, before that point, it was always yep. people trying to minimize drag, trying to maximize stability, you know, all the way back to the 20s and 30s, but in, in varying ways. And some of, those, some of those methods worked, some of them were accidental, some of them they kind of stumbled into and then tried to improve and couldn't and gave up. But when did, you know, aerodynamics is, is a science. It's always been a science. But when did motorsport, when did racing, racing engineers and designers start to look at it as, as a science? When did the tunnels start to come in? When, what, point, what point in the, in the curve? Um, yeah, I'm probably not a good enough historian on that. I know when I started doing it, and they had been doing it before that, you know, I'm guessing the Jim Hall... General Motors, Chaparral kind of era is yeah. probably when they probably started trying to stick them in wind tunnels. In, so you know, late, late 60s wind tunnels. And, and mid 60s, right? I'm guessing. Yeah. Yeah. So late, late yeah. 60s, mid 60s. And, and that's interesting, right? Because that whole period is when, you know, we, we talked about this on another episode, but that whole period is when there's massive change in engine development and how fast the cars were and very, very slow marches forward in handling and braking and chassis stiffness and a thousand other things. And so this was one of the great big leaps in speed and how, okay. So your, when, when was the first time you saw a wind tunnel? When was the first time you were in one? Mm, that would have probably been the early first time I ever got to go to a wind tunnel was probably the early nineties developing okay. a camel light car called the kudzu <laughs> and like the slant. Yeah, it, 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 a lot of people have probably heard of Jim Downing. If you have a Mazda, yeah. I'm sure you've heard of Jim Downing. And he built yeah. a car called the Kudzu Camel Light Car to go against the Spice Acuras. And so I was working with Sam Garrett, the guy that designed the Kudzu, and from, they're from Atlanta. 
And we went to the wind tunnel, the Lockheed Tunnel in Atlanta. And there you go, a Lockheed <laughs> Tunnel. It was an yeah. airplane tunnel that they could con quickly convert to race car use. So, it, okay. So the balance, you mentioned this earlier, right? You know, the, the airplane, the aviation thing is relevant because when you, you know, it, it is helpful to remember if you're just starting to learn about this stuff, that a wing is a wing. You turn it upside down, it still behaves like a wing. Laws of physics and, and flow don't change. And, and air, aircraft designers spend a great deal of time balancing lift and drag and what the wing does and how the wing's supposed to work. And that balance is, is constantly changing in motorsport, right? You know, you, you, you engineer up an airplane and you throw it into the sky and that's what that airplane is. And if you want to take it down and redesign it, that's great. But for the most part, that wing is then that airplane's wing. And in racing, every single weekend, if you're doing it right, you're thinking about the balance of the car and, and where it makes its aerodynamic grip and its mechanical grip, right? So at this point in the curve, you said this was, this was early 90s with the kudzu? Yep, yep, early 90s. And it was the thing is in any kind of testing that you're doing, you know, we don't race cars in the wind tunnel. They don't, uh, we don't peel the, the dragon downforce numbers out of our wind tunnel and present them to the organizers and they give you first, second or third <laughs> place based on who had the best numbers. So it all here's, has to here's be Here's my late. binder of hard work. Please right. don't fire me. Yeah. We won the wind tunnel race. <laughs> Yay. Um, yeah, the saddest never, statement never, in the world. Yeah, <laughs> never, <laughs> never won the wind tunnel race. Right, but so you have to make sure that everything you're doing, no matter no matter what you're testing, applies to the racetrack, and and ultimately has to make your car go faster. Otherwise, you're wasting your time and your money. So, in about that period of time, and I'm sure for Formula One teams it was earlier than this, but in about that time as the data acquisition systems on the cars on the track got better and better and the sensors were better and we could log data at a fast enough rate and we could put pressure sensors underneath the car to measure some pressure variances of the car both on the top surface and underneath it we started to be able to correlate the data for our drag and downforce again drag downforce most important things we we're trying to correlate that data to the real track you know was it accurate if it said we had 2000 pounds of downforce if the wind tunnel said that did we really and we could start to measure that by using strain gauges and measuring the actual force that the car was being pushed down to the ground with and we found uh, discrepancies let's say it wasn't super accurate why? Well, why is that? Why, why would the tunnel, because if the tunnel is air and the car is air and the real world is air and we're all just air, why was it different? Because it's not the same. That's gonna, <laughs> that sounds really stupid. Why is it different? Because it's not the same. Well, of course no, it's, it's not, it, because if it, it was, it wouldn't be different or something <laughs> like that. But, but it's, it sounds like the kind of thing that we could talk for 12 hours about and I still wouldn't understand, but I, okay. I really want so to here, understand it, why, it's, here's why it's not the same. When you drive a car, Let's say, first of all, we'll take the wind, you know, the, the breeze, the, the, the atmospheric wind outside. Let's say that's zero, just for easy figuring here. When you drive a car down a road, the car's, the wind is still, the car is moving, and the road is still. When you put a car in a wind tunnel, the road is still. The car is still, but the air is moving. And you go, well, what's the difference? The difference is there's a, the, the biggest, biggest single difference is there's a thing called the boundary layer. And without getting too complicated, let's say you have your wind tunnel. It's just a flat floor, right? And you have fans at one end and it's blowing air across this flat floor. That air sticks. You know, the first molecule of air that's touching the floor is going almost no speed because there's friction. The next molecule just a little bit above that is going a little faster. The one above that's going a little faster. The one above that. And you get to a point one inch off the floor where that next molecule at 1.01 inches is actually going the same speed as the air in the middle of the wind tunnel. But the airflow underneath 
for the airflow at on the floor is not what it is under a race car because there's no air being blown underneath the race car between the bottom of the car and the wind tunnel floor they are moving so this air this boundary layer that builds up on a, on the bottom of the floor screws up the underwing did that make sense no sort of uh, so okay I mean, it, it helps. I, had, I once had somebody expl- try, I had an engineer friend try to explain um, fluid dynamics to me in, in the sense of like trying to explain how water molecules work, because water is not air, but they, there's a lot of similarities Same. in how they move. And, and the best answer he came up with was something like, well, it's a bunch of little ball bearings in a giant pit. Imagine that, right? Imagine you stick your hand through them and they all start moving and some of them kind of grab onto each other and some of them don't. And in the end, like everything affects everything else around it, but it's really hard to model because there's so many tiny pieces. And also there's this Heisenbergian thing where you don't quite know what all the tiny pieces are doing at any given point. And at that point, I took like three more sips of beer and looked at him and blinked a lot. And he, he said, do you understand that? And I went sort of, and then it took me like three weeks after to think about it. I go, oh, in the shower. But um, God, yes, yeah. I think so. So how? Let so me, this is why this is why like ground plane tunnels came in, right? Like rolling road surfaces, right? Right. So we're talking no rolling road here. We're talking okay. a flat, flat wind tunnel. Put the car okay. on it, blow air over it. Okay. So the the problem is this boundary layer that builds up between the road and the bottom of the car which isn't yeah. there in the real world because there's why isn't it there well because air is not blowing over the road because it's the in the wind tunnel it's the air that's blowing over the road that sticks to the road sticks to the floor i should say in the wind tunnel the okay. air is blowing over the floor and it sticks to the floor okay in the real world there's no air blowing over the road the air is zero miles an hour. The floor is zero miles an hour. And the car is going through the air. So if you picture the air being blown from the fan in the wind tunnel across the road, the air is sticking to the road in this kind of weird shape where it's stuck right to the road, to the floor, close to it, and then has this weird kind of the velocity of the air changes as it gets further from the road. So you have this boundary layer. Just think of it as the air that's disrupted by the floor of the wind tunnel, right? Because as the air flows over it, it's going to stick, it's going to tumble molecules, it's going to be, it's going to be, there's air blowing over that. Just like you stick your hand out the car window, you can feel air blowing over it and it's disrupted by your hand and you can feel it on your hand. That's not what happens. In the real world, there's no air blowing over the road. So, so how the, does that change how, how say, a wing works? How does that change how an underfloor works? It doesn't what, change what do you have so much. And this for? is where the original tunnels that were had a flat floor, like I just described, weren't yeah. terrible in the early cars that didn't have ground effects. Because okay. they were flat on the bottom, pretty high off the ground, and they had... They were all using the top surface of the vehicle to make the downforce wings, spoilers, the shape of the body to push it down. Once we started getting ground effects, especially tunnels, some shape to the floor to try to make some downforce. Now the interaction of the air between the car and the, and the road became ultra critical. And unless you modeled that perfectly, it never applied to the racetrack because <laughs> it was a completely different environment that you were running. You were in the tunnel, you were running with air blowing under between the car and the road. And in the real world, you weren't doing that at all. Okay. So, so I can see our producer, Mike making, I can see Mike in the background, making a face like a scowly Mike face. So I, every time this this can be good. Every time Mike makes a scowly face, I'm going to have to remember that I'm probably making that scowly face, and I should sit here and context <laughs> it up. So, okay, so 
race cars with the with the with a few exceptions right there was the the chaparral fan car where they had you know the 60s where they literally had a fan in the back of the car a snowmobile engine yep. blowing pulling air out from underneath the car to create negative pressure underneath it and it sucks a bad word but suck the thing to the ground right and then with with few exceptions like that ground effect didn't really come into race cars until the late 70s Lotus in Formula One, they started using the underbody of the car, not as a wing itself, but using it the way wings use air to create negative pressure, correct? Yep. Yep. Okay. So that, that whole, so when you, so basically what you're saying here is that if you have dumb car that doesn't use its underside, <laughs> the underside doesn't use its bottom. Um, if you have dumb car that doesn't use its bottom, then you can use a wind tunnel that doesn't have a rolling road in it, right? And it's useful-ish, or it's still less useful. It is. It, it is. There's some. There's some. There's a couple wind tunnels in Charlotte right now that NASCAR teams will still use for rough work. Okay. Because a NASCAR underneath a NASCAR car it has to be pretty flat. They're not allowed to sculpt it. They're not allowed to do a lot of creative things underneath the car. Still, the the difference that boundary layer still screws up the flow underneath the car. It's not exactly like um, the real world, but it could, it's a better representation. You can get some good rough ideas. And especially if you're only concerned with the top side of the car, if you're, if you're just worried about your rear wing and you want, you want to go try your rear wing. Well, the disruption of the air because of the boundary layer is going to be the same every time you turn the fans on. And you're just working on the wing, so it doesn't really matter. You're doing relative A to Bs. Okay, one degree of wing okay. gave me 100 pounds more downforce. Two degrees gave me 200 pounds more. Three degrees stalled the rear wing, and we lost all our downforce. Okay, great. We know that. We don't really care what's happening under the car. But if you want to get really accurate, you have to, you have to try to make the wind tunnel have the same boundary layer under the car as the real world which is zero okay. so they okay. started to come up with some ways to do that they put a little v like a i mean i've been in wind tunnels where they have literally used two by fours put them <laughs> in a v shape 10 feet in front of the car sticking up two inches and the idea is to scrape that boundary layer off the floor so you kind of direct the air so the boundary layer is a kind of a thick lower speed air so the air comes flowing over it hits this v-shaped two by four it pushes the boundary layer to the side of the car and there's no boundary layer under it basically there's no air flowing under the car that has this boundary layer in it worked okay they tried to put <laughs> strips in front of the car with giant vacuum and they tried to suck the boundary layer down off the floor Okay. So that there was no boundary layer under it. Work Wait, better. like actually, actually running vacuums beneath the floor to pull it down, like to pull air yep. off the floor? Yep. Because okay. this boundary layer is stuck to the floor. And maybe, maybe I just thought, maybe a way to describe the boundary layer. If you took a piece of wood, put it at a 45 degree angle, took a ketchup bottle, and squeezed ketchup out of it at the top of that piece of wood, the ketchup would like start to flow down this wood. Right? Yeah. The ketchup stuck to the wood would be going slow. The ketchup farthest away from the wood would be rolling pretty fast. That's a boundary layer of ketchup. <laughs> Jeff, on your that, wood. Makes, that, makes, that makes so much more sense. Oh my God. Okay. Okay. I, I just we had this, found this, image, this image of a guy with a ketchup bottle and a two by four doing a thing that literally no human in the history of time has ever done. I'm like, now I need some ketchup. I need a, right. I need a giant piece of wood. I need a, that makes total sense. So, so okay, that's so, your. That's the boundary layer. Right. With air stuck to your floor of your wind tunnel. It's okay. stuck at the bottom and it's going fast as you go further away from the wood. You know, that's okay. so that. Yeah. But when your car's going down a racetrack, there's no ketchup stuck to your racetrack. It's maybe not your race car. Because there's no ketchup flowing on your racetrack. It's <laughs> maybe not your racetrack. <laughs> there you go. So we had to we had to get the, rid of that boundary layer somehow to make it more like the real world. We tried to put shapes in front of it to 
knocked the boundary layer away. We tried to put, and, and I'm talking real slits with some, I mean, it's not your, you know, your Lowe's vacuum cleaner. It's a very powerful vacuum cleaner to try to suck that boundary layer down before it gets to the car. Yeah. And then somebody said, you know, uh, it was never really that accurate. It was pretty good. But when the ground effects, when, when winning or losing became how good your ground effects were, you had to model that very, very accurately. And you say, some people would say, well, why don't you just go drive it outside and measure it? You have all this great measuring equipment on your race car. Why don't you go measure it outside? Problem is, it takes a long time because you got to fire the car up, run the engine. You got to buy tires. You got to go someplace. You have to go someplace that's really flat because if it's uphill or downhill, it's not accurate. You have to go someplace that has no wind because if you have a headwind or a crosswind, it affects all your results. So like any scientific experiment, you need to control the variables. And when you do it outside, it's, there's a lot of variables. And people still have good success. It's called coast down testing. You go whipping out at 180 miles an hour, put the clutch in, stick it in neutral, and you coast. And you get all your data from your sensors on board. And then you turn around and go the other way and you coast. Kind of like a real world wind tunnel. There's still a lot of coast down testing done, but they even wanted to get more accurate and be able to do 20 runs, 20 different changes in a day, 30, 40 different changes in a day, and not have a driver and wear out your gearbox and all of that kind of stuff. So somebody said, why don't we make the floor of the wind tunnel move? And they went, how would we do that? Ketchup, obviously. <laughs> yeah, no ketchup involved. <laughs> a lot of money. Right. They made the floor a belt, a stainless steel belt. Picture two drums, one be way behind the car, one way in front of the car. The floor is now a stainless steel belt as wide as the car that goes, and you turn these drums on, and the floor now moves. It's like a conveyor belt. Or it's like your treadmill. Exactly like your treadmill. I like that you but think the I belt's exercise. Made out That's of stainless good. Keep steel. thinking that. Yeah. <laughs> so it would be as if you took your car and put it on top of your treadmill and turned your treadmill on. The wheels of your car would turn. Your treadmill turns. And now, if you're going to blow air over your car, let's say 100 miles an hour, you run your treadmill at 100 miles an hour. Now the difference in speed between the air and the road or the floor is zero. They're both going right. 100 miles an hour, which is right. exactly what the real world is. The air is going zero and the track's going zero and the car is going over it. So now what we've done is just held the car still and moved the air and the floor at the same speed. Now we're actually matching what happens in the real world. Okay. So, so more, more context on this. So I, it's worth noting too, and I have never been in one. I know you've been in well, many of them, but what I, what I find amazing about this is that you have to remember that we're talking about, we're talking about a giant room that is usually sometimes in, in, in a giant air circuit loop, right? It is a room within a, a big path of air that might be the size of a building, but it's a room with an enormous fan on it, driven by hundreds of horsepower that pushes air over a model or a full-scale car in that sealed room at 100, 150 miles an hour, if not faster. I mean, one of the things you mentioned in the book is that you know, when, you went, when you went down to Lockheed and they're like, well, you know, 150 miles an hour, that's basically walking for us because 150 mile an hour plane is not a fast airplane, but that's, yep. you know, aerodynamics on a race cars start to take effect at what, 70, 80 miles an hour, somewhere around there, highway speed basically, right? Oh, man, I mean, Formula SAE guys are worried that they don't make enough downforce okay. at 40 oh, right. miles an hour. Yeah, fair. Solo, solo two stuff. Yeah, all that stuff. I forgot about that. So, but so when you're in the thing, is it? And I picture like the inside of the spaceship in two thousand one, right? Like a Kubrick film. Is it just this big white room? What are they like? What do you when when you're in the box? What is the box? Oh, it's really cool, actually. It's it's <laughs> like a big. Yeah, it's like a big laboratory Pirate ketchup. Yeah. So you can see, you, you, you put your car in there, 
and you attach it, and we won't get into how you attach it, but you attach it anyway to the, you don't want your car coming loose and blowing. The The thing that wind tunnel guys really hate is if you leave like a, I don't know, your jacket on the rear wing and when they turn the wing on and it gets sucked into the fans, that's, <laughs> they are, they freak out. They, it, have you, a lot have of them even have an inspector. Is that why? <laughs> <laughs> they come around and what, look okay. like uh, don't leave I mean, your, I've, don't I've, leave that don't leave your notebook yeah and I've, I've read that i mean a lot of that has to do with the fact that like the blades are both massive and really expensive and the way they move air and like it's all like that's that's all part of the keeping everything controlled right i mean it's, yeah. it's actually it's not just because they don't want to fish your jacket out of the out of the holes it's because you can actually do real damage to this giant building size scientific machine right they're expensive too and yeah i remember going to nrc tunnel in canada and they're giving us the tour you know the the whatever one dollar tour when you get there and they're showing us all their stuff and everything <laughs> this was a giant wind tunnel and the guy goes and we got to the fan and it was one giant fan i mean i'm talking 20 feet in diameter the blades okay the blades yeah. were turning <laughs> and they have like you know, you, you look at the thing and you look at the motor and you go, wow. And then you go outside and you go, oh, I know why that power substation is right here next to the building <laughs> because it takes a lot of power to turn that thing. And the guy said, yeah, you know, it took us like a year to commission it, to get it right and everything. And I said, well, like, well, how come so long? He goes, well, you know, we just really struggled with the tips of the blades going supersonic and shooting a shockwave down the wind tunnel. What? <laughs> like, re, re, whoa. What, what does that even look like? What, how, yeah. what the, the blades were so big that the tip speed of the blade was supersonic. Man. And they had to figure out how to get rid of the shock wave, the sonic boom basically caused by the tip of the wind tunnel blades. Hey, you think about, yeah. I love thinking about the scale here. You know, I've seen pictures of, and friends have actually been in, you know, the, the, the tunnels that like GE uses for engine nacelles on, you know, the seven X seven, um, series of Boeing's things like that. Or, you know, you see like the giant, you know, when Boeing will do, you know, big full scale wing tests and they're massive. And you think about the fact that even the small ones, the amount of power they have to draw you, you and I, a couple episodes, a couple shows ago, we're talking about Adrian Newey's book, how to build a car. You know, Newey is those, those people don't know he's the, probably the single most influential person in Formula One in the last hell, 30 years. Engineer, designer, aerodynamicist, one of those guys who's said to be able to see air. And, you know, he talks about coming up through his career and having to get in the 80s and 90s, having to get wind tunnel access at night because that was the only way the, the local grids in some of these places in England could draw enough power, right? Because otherwise they'd I be turning it. a brownout in, in the rest of the rest of the town or the county or whatever it was. So, yep. so when you're in the thing, like, I know you can't go in it when it's running, but do they let you in it when it's spooling down? Like when you walk in there and there's a 60 mile an hour wind or whatever it is? <laughs> what, what? <laughs> that is, I, so I was, we were talking about that kudzu in the Lockheed Tunnel. So me and Sam yeah. Garrett had come up with, you call it a model change because your car's in the wind tunnel and you're going to change the model. It's really the car, right? You're going to change a wing angle or put a new wing on it or change a ride height or change it some way to do another test to see how this new gadget or widget or gurney flap or tab or whatever works. They charge you by the hour in a wind tunnel. <laughs> <laughs> the, some of the rolling road wind tunnels like wind shear are yeah. really expensive per hour. So the idea is to get as many model changes per hour as you can, because you want to get through your run plan. Maybe you have two days worth of time. You want to knock everything out if you can. Yeah. So our, we practiced, we had our crew and everything and we practiced like a pit stop the week before we had our, I think. Yeah, I think we had 40, <laughs> we had a, about 40 model changes we wanted to get through. So we had them in order, like, okay, this one would be the shortest change to this one, which would be the next shortest change to that one. Yeah. So we could do it efficiently. And we practiced right. the whole thing with the crew guys. Okay, ready, go. Okay, stop. Okay, 48 seconds. How, now we can turn the weight tunnel back on. How big was the model? How big? It was a full scale car. Okay. Okay. So, full, so it's an yeah. actual car or a full scale model of the car? Yep. So this was not a rolling, this was not a rolling road tunnel. It was a fixed ground plane tunnel. 
okay. back in the nineties that we put the whole car in. Okay. And so, but even with a model, you're doing the same thing, you know, a half scale model, 40% model, you're still right. jumping into the wind tunnel to change your little bitty parts that you've 3d printed, and put them on. Um, so we practiced all of that and we got to the wind tunnel and we didn't realize at the time, the first time we went, that the wind tunnel had a spool down. You couldn't just like, okay, we got the number 150 miles an hour and just run out there. You'd just be blown that way at 150 miles an hour. And that's when Sam gets sucked into the cheese grater. Okay. Right. So you, you, and? So they have a door with this big blinking red light, like danger, danger, danger. And we're like, we could probably sneak in there sooner than when the red light stops. So we're turning the knob. Oh, my beer. It turns out... Turns out the doorknob is synced to the wind speed. And when the wind speed okay. gets below 30 miles an hour, clunk, it opens up and you can go in. So we're sitting there with our trying to open the doorknob as much as we can every time. <laughs> and suddenly it clunks open and we run in there at 30 miles an hour. 30 miles an hour. Doesn't sound like a lot, yeah. but you're, yeah. you're still blowing around pretty good. Yeah. So we're in there trying to change stuff, run back out. Clunk. The minute we slam the door, the little green light goes on in the control tower and they crank it back up again. <laughs> that's, that's what, I mean, you forget that the forces, it's so easy because, you know, what is it? Humans can only, we can only really move on our own as fast as we can run. And a really, really fast human who's running is, you know, somewhere in 25 miles an hour or whatever it is. And you forget that like wind is a thing and it is a physic air is a physical thing that is hitting you. And it's not just like, oh, I stuck my head out the window at 60 miles an hour. You know, I, I don't like, I, I went outside in a, a thunder, a windstorm when we lived on the West Coast once. And it was one of those things where I walked out the door, couldn't open the door, and then nearly fell over and thought, oh, God, yeah. that must be like 70 mile an hour wind because I'm a moron. And went inside, looked it up. It was like 20 knots or something. Right. I mean, it's just like the fact that there's so much mass of gas moving at you, which incidentally will, is probably what I'll call my autobiography. But Mass of gas. Yeah. I sure. mean, that's, and that's what we're doing in a wind tunnel, right? It's all about yeah. that controlling that like a, the rolling road wind tunnels that got rid of the boundary layer like we talked about which yeah. are really nice really accurate they started out as scale models because that whole belt moving belt system is expensive to make a big one and so they said well why don't we don't have to use the whole car let's just make a small model of it maybe half size and we'll put it in a wind tunnel and we'll scale up the forces and it'll be representative. And they made a rolling road wind tunnel, kind of like a treadmill, right? I mean, you could make a little tiny one-tenth scale and use a treadmill and run it fast enough. And that was pretty accurate. There's a thing called the Reynolds number, which is Mr. Reynolds, I guess. Um, it's a number that takes aerodynamic <laughs> forces and compares them based on the scale of the model because it's not linear. The force doesn't okay. go up. If you double the size, the downforce doesn't go up linear. It's not exactly doubled. Makes Reynolds sense. Reynolds figured out this formula. Everybody uses it and you can, and it's accurate. And you can say, okay, if we make this much in a 50% scale model, we'll have this much drag and this much downforce on the real racetrack. And it comes pretty accurate one of the other problems is if your wind tunnel is too small you get what they call blockage so let's say I, you have a i will tube. not make any jokes okay <laughs> <laughs> i made jeff brown laugh finally that's a good my joke I, I know where you're going my stupid dad jokes oh man go on yes I know where you're let's going. be adults again sure okay <laughs> so blockage <laughs> is similar to what you're thinking of it's the race car stuck in this tube Aren't we all, and though? What happens with the race car, when the air hits it, it <laughs> bounces off, right? And in yeah. the real world, if you're not racing next to somebody, it just bounces off and goes into the atmosphere, into the air. But in a wind tunnel, it could bounce off and hit the wall of the wind tunnel and then return and interact with the air at the back of the car and screw up your readings because that's not what really happened. You get good... You get a number from the wind tunnel that isn't accurate because the air is bouncing off the walls of the wind tunnel and coming back, interacting with the car. Yeah, right. So you want as big a tube as you can get. And then a, I mean, 
the car I, inside. I have no jokes to make on that front, but yes. <laughs> Two in one episode. Go on. You want a big, it's, I, I'm not going to say it out loud right. again because I'm not going to be able to not laugh. You want the right. large uh, receptacle. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. So as you pointed out, these buildings are massive because the, it's called the test section where you put the car. The one in North Carolina, probably the premier wind tunnel in the world, for sure the premier rentable wind tunnel, you know, that's not exclusive to a Formula One team, is called Windshear, and it's in Charlotte. And it was built by Gene Haas, and it's a commercial the available wind tunnel. I've been in it a few times with various cars. It's a full scale rolling road wind tunnel. So you can put, you can put a Indy car, you can put a NASCAR cup car in there. The test section is massive. So there's no blockage problems. I mean, this thing is like, it, it's about the size of a basketball court and you put your car in the middle of it and it's open side to side, front to back, as big as a basketball court. God. And the floor is a stainless steel belt that'll run at 150 miles an hour, wider than a NASCAR car and about twice as long. How, and the, okay, pa, pa, hold on a sec. How, yep. so one of the things that's mentioned in the book with rolling road tunnels is that that, that belt runs on a platen, which I'm enough of a dork that all I think of is typewriter platen, which is the thing that rolls the paper forward, but it's similar, right? And, yep. and there's light duty discussion of keeping that belt cool. And the fact that initially it was water cooling and that there are other answers and like, if, if it's that big and it's moving that fast, how do you keep it? How, like, what do you do with the heat? Where does it all go? How does it, like the, the logistics on the, 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 that system alone are deeply rad. What, what does that look like? Um, yeah, there's some of that is still probably trade secrets. I don't know them, but uh, yeah. they gave me the basics. Okay. There's a company called MTS that builds a lot of this equipment. They build shaker rigs. They do wind tunnels. They do KNC rigs, a lot of, of vehicle dynamics testing equipment. The, the one at Windshear I know has, so maybe we should back up. You have those two rollers and you have this, the floor that's moving, the stainless steel floor, thin yeah. stainless steel floor that's moving. It could, if you just had two rollers and you have a car on it, a ground effects car making an easy, uh, an average car can make a thousand pounds of downforce underneath the car. So suction, basically, it's trying to suck the road up to the bottom of the floor. Well, it's trying to pull that stainless steel floor right. up with a thousand pounds of force. Yeah. But Which you can't let it do, you can't let, yeah, <laughs> but you can't let it do that in the wind tunnel because that's not what the road does. The road doesn't come up. So they put, I don't know, thousands, hundreds of thousands of tiny little holes in the, below the belt. And then they draw a vacuum on that and they vacuum the belt down and You're they kidding. pull harder on the floor on the stainless steel belt than the car wow, than the car man. pulls up holy hell well wow and as you said then you have the stainless steel belt rubbing on the surface that has yeah. the holes in it and so it gets hot so then they have water tubes in the floor below the belt to cool the belt as it goes over it so you have big <laughs> radiators, giant radiators to take the heat away of the friction between the belt and the floor that it's being sucked down to. That's nuts. That, yeah. that, that's absolutely nuts. I mean, the, the forces at work with all this are, are eye-opening and, and just mind-blowing, you know? Okay, so from a, from a you, know, you mentioned an average car being roughly 1,000 pounds of downforce. What, I forget, is, is Formula One up in like seven or? 8,000? Where are we with F1 or IndyCar these days? Oof. You know what I mean? I mean, IndyCar, Formula One, I'm not sure. Uh, IndyCar, I'll give you an LMP2 car. An LMP2 car okay. will make two... It depends on the speed, obviously. Most people use 150 miles an hour as a reference. That's pretty much mm -hmm. kind of the standard auto racing reference. So yeah. 150 miles an hour, 
well over 2,000 pounds. A current GTP car will make another five, 600 pounds over that, pushing 3,000 pounds. Back in the day, the old um, GTP cars, like the Nismo cars and the, you know, the Electromotive cars, were making close to 6,000 pounds of downforce with those giant wings and those big bodies and 1,000 yeah. horsepower. So it's not hard to make downforce. It's hard to make downforce really efficiently. And nowadays, we don't have 1,000 horsepower. We have 500, 600, 700, and it's all about efficiency. So in a wind tunnel, we measure efficiency as L over D, lift over drag. How much lift, negative lift, how much downforce can we make for every pound of drag? And the efficiency numbers in the last 15 years have gone way up. The cars make a lot more downforce for the amount of drag than we used to make in the 80s, 90s. Is that just in, I mean, it can't be in like we came up with better wing. It all has to be in how... How, how the aero devices are integrated with the rest of the car. And like, it all has to be in, in the balance and the packaging, right? Exactly. Exactly. And that's what wind tunnels help people understand is <laughs> you have a wing at the front of the car, the Indy car, and that air goes over the wing, but it's not done. It's got a side pod. It's got a radiator. It's got a, a cockpit to go around. It's got an engine cover to go around. And then it finally gets to the rear wing and it's got to interact with that. And so we used wind tunnels to try to understand the airflow around the whole car and shape it as efficiently as possible, not make it hit flat surfaces, which are high drag, make it go where you want it to go. And you see that now, you see the results of that in the sort of organic shapes that will look at the front wing of a Formula One car. It looks like it grew in somebody's vegetable garden, right? I mean, it's organic kind of, it's not an engineer flat surfaces and we'll put one here and we'll put the angle here. It's all this organic kind of twisting kind of thing. And that all grew out of first wind tunnels and then computational fluid dynamics, which we can talk about. But that's, it's all about managing that flow throughout the whole car and not just the first section of it. And that's why the Formula One cars look so, I begin, <laughs> my only word is organic. It doesn't look mechanical and, and angles and cuts. It's, it has this kind of flow to it. Yeah. One of the, a, a friend of mine about, I guess about a year, year and a half ago pointed out that, um, he really enjoyed watching F1 of the rain. I was like, yeah, okay. You're rain. I love watching rain race. It's great. He's like, no. And, and this particular gentleman has a background in, um, <laughs> has a background in, I don't know how to say this without, a, without saying it wrong so i'll probably say something that's probably wrong so forgive me if you're hearing but he has a background in something like x-plane design for the government top secret stuff yada 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 clearance airframes airfoils etc and he was saying that he cool. loved watching in the rain because he liked watching the wash that came off the cars and then afterward he would just go and pick up pictures online and pull apart you know like so-and-so's side pods give this much and so-and-so's rear wing gives this much and that and watching what the air did off the car in the rain is obvious because the water and the spray is moving and you can see it moving, right? You can see what the air is doing. And then I, I thought about this because actually when, when you and I met in person, was at, uh, it was last year at Petit, right? At Road Atlanta in the fall mm -hmm. and it rained. And I walked out, I hiked out, you know, I had, had a whole day to burn there. Not burn, it was great. Uh, but I hiked out to the S's and like, you know, walked through all the campsites and all the people drinking beer and then spilling beer on cars and then spilling cars on beer and all these other things and stood in the S's in the pouring rain for, uh, man, must have been, must have been a, an hour, hour and a half, just in my little jacket and an umbrella, just getting soaked, watching the prototypes, watching the GTP, GTP cars come down into it and then back up, up the hill. And it was really interesting watching the wash off of them, how and when and where and why all of it moved. And just thinking about that and then thinking about, you know, people, people talk about, you know, how like on super speedways, the forces at work in say NASCAR, where, you know, somebody can be moving out to pass and then all of a sudden, you know, there's a crash for some reason that doesn't make any sense as somebody pops out of the draft. One of the things in the book that, that, that Paul mentions, or you mentioned, I forget where it was, but he's talking, talking to somebody at Ford. And again, this is 30 years ago. 
but air is still air. He's talking to somebody at Ford about how the forces change as you pass another car. And basically, as you as you pull out, it was something like when two cars are running side by side, there's 40% more drag on both of them than when there's a car alone. That's that wall of air. And then when you pull out in about one car length, the rear of the car goes from the, just the air moving around the both of them it goes from like 100 pounds of downforce to 50 pounds of lift, snap, and then back to 450 pounds of downforce for turning back to 100 again. And it's just this yep. big windy hand of God smacking the car around at 190 miles an hour. And you, you think about that. And the fact that you can't see it is almost a crime because it's fascinating stuff. <laughs> it's, you're exactly right. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's that amazing. Whole- that whole NASCAR thing is, so my son Colin drove NASCAR for four years yeah, and yeah. he came from road racing and he yeah. was testing at Daytona for his first time, hadn't been to Daytona in a NASCAR car. And he's out there driving around and they're coming through, I can't remember where it was, but anyway, he was next to another car and he spun and it was like at Daytona going pretty fast. Yeah. And he was like didn't really understand exactly what had happened. And basically, I can't remember, maybe it was Kyle Busch or somebody, but anyway, he basically sucked the air off Colin's rear spoiler going into turn one at Daytona. (laughs) Put the car in the right spot where Colin, lap after lap, had a certain amount of air on the rear spoiler, and Kyle did something and then pulled away real quick, and the air went off Colin's spoiler and spun around. Didn't touch him. When you, when you think yeah. about, I mean, if you really know, and that, that's the cool thing about NASCAR, right? For a long time, I was interested in it, in like kind of at arm's length and, and, you know, it was fine. It was what it was. And, you know, the technology was interesting, and, you know, the, especially when they were making massive, massive power about 20 years ago. But, you know, when you really start talking to people in the cars and you learn just how much the tactics revolve around what the air is doing and the fact that the guys who've been in it, the men and women who've been in it for a long time being really good at the top of the sport, they have, you know, they play that matrix out in their head constantly while they're also driving the car at a 190 yeah. or 200 miles an hour. And in that whole period, like some, but everybody else, the entire pack is doing that on you running a long game for yep. this lap, 10 laps forward, where they might move, when things might happen. It's, it's amazing. And, and then you realize that you know, any given super speedway race is just a series of controlled, not crashes for a couple of hours. And then people screw up. It's nuts. Yep. Okay. So I, well, I, I didn't mean to run away with that. Sorry. The, the, so how is it that the, the wind tunnel if it's that accurate, and I know there's an answer, I don't know what the answer is, why, why do we still test? Why do you see F1 cars with fences and Flovis on them? What's, what, do you, what do you get out of the real world that you don't get out of a rolling road? So where, where this has gone, it's, it seems weird to say this, yeah. but the wind tunnel is now part of a validation tool for the computational fluid dynamics, CFD. CFD is nothing more than a wind tunnel in a computer. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> if, and I'll explain that real quickly. Let's say you had a molecule, you had your car sitting, you know, you had your car going. Here's a better way to explain it. You have your car parked. You have a molecule of air coming at it at 150 miles an hour. It hits a part of the front wing. Mm -hmm. It's going to, that molecule of air is going to be ricocheting off at some angle. There's another molecule of air right behind it or right above it that it might bump into. And then that, those two molecules ricochet another way. And then they (laughs) hit another part of the wing. And those two molecules ricochet another way into, 10,000 other molecules that are ricocheting from other ways. It's all math. If you had one molecule of air and it, you could do, write the math for, okay, it hits this part of the car that is at this angle. It's going to go at this angle at this speed, and it's going to hit the next piece at this speed, and that's angled at this angle, so it's going to ricochet then this other direction. You could do that with one molecule of air and write the math. Just an equation, just a physics problem. 
Computational fluid dynamics takes a million molecules of air, rushes them at the car, writes the math for how each one of those molecules hit each part of the car that it's going to hit, and then also bump into each other and how what the forces, speeds, and angles of each molecule bumping into each other are and where they ricochet off and compiles all of those forces into a total downforce and drag number of that shape that the molecules have hit. It's mind-blowing, but with the computing power we have now, yeah, you can actually put a model, which is a computer code, of the shape of the car and run air over it, quote air, virtual air over it, right. and get an answer, just like a wind tunnel. How, what's the, so, so when you say it's a validation thing, I, it's to, what's the accuracy? Uh, how are we, how far off are we talking about with the math? I, I like how CFD is basically just fancy words for math, air, math, math, air move, math, liquid move. <laughs> That's exactly what it is. It's how, exactly how, how what it is. It get? And it has become, there, there was periods where CFD was held back by the pure computing power, the raw number of okay. cores that you could. Because to do one run, there were, you know, back in 2012, I was doing a big aerodynamic program and we would run to get one run. You know, we have the shape of the car and we want to get the answer, downforce and drag from CFD. It could take yeah. four hours of computing power. These big, giant, <laughs> giant supercomputers cranking out the math for these millions of particles of air. To get one number, okay, here's your downforce, here's your drag. It takes four hours, and you're just smoking these computers. And and as it gets better, it's gotten more accurate and faster and faster. And so to the point where CFD is actually a better way now to test than wind tunnels. It's a better way to get answers quicker. You can make more changes. But just like wind tunnels, when we first used them as a testing tool, we had to be sure that they were accurate and, and actually translated to the racetrack. We're now using wind tunnels to confirm our CFD results. Okay, our CFD says this shape <laughs> makes this much force, downforce, and this much drag. Got to be sure our CFD is right. Let's go to the wind yeah. tunnel with that same model. <laughs> yep, yep. Okay, that does. That CFD model is good. Eh, let's go to the racetrack and put these big, these big pressure sensors. You see those big grids like you were talking about, Sam, on the yeah. Formula One cars in testing? That's yeah. all, again, to validate the CFD model. And if, How often, the engineers then, if the engineers then get to the point where they go, ah, man, we trust our CFD model. We try it in the model, we try it at the racetrack, and they match. We try it in the wind tunnel, and it matches. Man, the CFD model is great. Then they go, all right, now we can test CFD models 24 hours a day. As long as we want, we don't have to have a model you know, an actual race car model, physical model. We don't have to go to the racetrack. We don't have to use our wind tunnel at all this great expense. We're just going to do it all in our computer. But it's the old garbage in, garbage out, right? If, unless you're sure that the data you're putting in is good and translates to the racetrack, then your CFD model is no good. So most of that work, most of the wind tunnel work, and I'm talking high level, Formula One. Yeah. Even down to IndyCar, not as much, and certainly not at sports car level. You're still, the, the CFD work isn't as sports car level for the hypercars, Ferrari, Toyota, you know, that kind of level. Yes, it is. Okay. But the, at the very, very highest level of, of racing, CFD is where it's at, and the wind tunnel and the track stuff is to validate that model. That's nuts. Okay, so you mentioned earlier, um, there's one, hey, one more thing before we run out of time. You mentioned earlier, and we, we were talking about this a little before the show, but you mentioned Coast Down, right? The notion that that still matters and there, there, there is still, I, I know there are Coast Down tunnels that are used. What we're, one of the things we were talking about before the show was Chip Ganassi, um, you know, NASCAR and IndyCar owner and it's been tied to sports cars forever. Uh, famously years and years ago bought an old Pennsylvania turnpike tunnel in Pennsylvania and turned it into a kind of uh, turned it into an indoor moving 
moving wind tunnel where they throw NASCAR, they throw cup cars in there and run down the length of the thing. And there's a turntable at each end and if the car gets to the end, then the turntable spits it around and it runs back the other way and it's climate controlled and they can do it all day long and all year round. And it's, it's not the only one in the world. There's one in England as well, but what does that get you? What, what is a, what does the coast down tunnel get you that CFD can't? How does that work? Well, it was probably derived first from standard coast down testing, which has the atmospheric condition. The wind is the problem, okay. right? You have side winds, you have headwinds, and it changes. So it's not like you can say, okay, Tuesday, we had a six mile an hour tailwind all day long and it was consistent. So we can go do our coast down aerodynamic testing. It doesn't, it changes all the time. So inside, the tunnel, which I guess that tunnel was like an old, it wasn't a train tunnel, was it? It was a car tunnel that they yeah. diverted the road around, right? Yeah, it was a, a turnpike tunnel for Pennsylvania Turnpike. Yeah. So, and it, I think it happened to be very, very flat. It was like ideal for, for this testing. So once you go in the tunnel, there's no wind, obviously. There's no side wind, right. crosswind, tailwind. Perfect. You could, you could, um, like you said, do the turntable and turn around and get runs both directions. So it was kind of driven by getting more accurate, real coast down testing. Okay. Then they tried to improve that even more, much like a wind tunnel where we talked about a rolling road wind tunnel where you're running your car. And it's expensive, right? Per hour, we talked about that. One of the things that affects the car a lot is the ride height of the car. And it affects it aerodynamically, how close it is to the ground, how far away it is from the ground. So on the wind tunnels with the models, they'll actually use servo motors in, on the suspension so they can start the air and they can, through their computer, lower the car close to the ground. These servo motors will and lower the car and then mm-hmm. raise it up notch by notch by notch and get a full map of the ride heights of the car in the wind tunnel. Sure. What the Ganassi guys did was put those servo similar bigger ones on the actual car and they could go (laughs) whipping down one way, turn it around, change the ride height by, you know, a little computer program, go down the other way, go up and down, up and down and map their ride heights with their Indy cars (laughs) and their NASCAR That's car. so cool. <laughs> it's so ridiculous and so cool at the same time. But, but you had to have a guy driving it. Like, yeah, and they had to yeah. hire like pro race car drivers because this thing is not very wide and you're going 150 right. miles an hour and it's dark. Right. Right. And after about 10 runs, I, I know some guys that have driven in there and the smoke gets to you. You got to wear like a big giant, like World War II <laughs> gas mask under your helmet because it's... It gets carbon monoxide in there really bad. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it takes some driver skill not to crash the thing because you'd be really bad if you crashed in the middle of that wind tunnel. Right. Like being shot out of a barrel. What? Yeah. Okay. So, how, so do they still use, because the one, the one in England, um, and I was actually reading about this, I didn't know about it for the show. I was looking up the Ganassi tunnel, um, which is, Again, in Pennsylvania, the England Tunnel is, it's called Catesby Tunnel, um, and it's used for movies and road car testing and, you know, oddly enough, like a lot of cycle racing, bicycle racing stuff. Oh, something yeah. like Something like 15,000 pounds a day to rent it. And naturally, I looked at the pricing page. I was like, what would I do with it? But what, wow. like, <laughs> does, does Ganassi, like, is, are, are those things still active? Are they still used? Or is, like, is there, is there just a point where CFD gets so good that even that doesn't matter? I mean, how, where does that curve end? Yeah, and I don't know um, about the Ganassi Tunnel anymore. Yeah, I, th- I think it's still it's I think it's still in use. And okay. again, I would bet, and now I'm just speculating here, that it's again would be used to verify your CFD. Right. You still have to verify that stuff. You know, shaker rigs. We're trying to do you know, measure the suspension, but we still got to go to the racetrack and make sure that our testing methods are accurate and our results are accurate. So there's nothing you, you couldn't, I don't think anybody trusts. It's like simulation. You and I talked about simulation in a few episodes ago, right? 
you still have to go to the racetrack and verify that your simulation is correct so that you have supreme confidence in the next simulation answer you get. Because if you're not sure it's right and it gives you another answer, are you really going to go to the racetrack and use that? (laughs) Not unless you can be sure that it correlates, that the simulation works at the racetrack or the CFD actually does give you that much drag and that much downforce. And as you keep doing those correlations, your CFD gets more accurate and more accurate and you trust it more and more and you don't have to use the wind tunnel and the coast downs and things like that as much and the CFD becomes more accurate. And then it filters down from Formula One to IndyCar to NASCAR to sports cars. And, you know, simulation, You, I mean, in the simulation now, you can, there's some free simulation programs online that club racers can use. <laughs> the CFD will eventually filter down and it'll become available to everybody and it'll be very accurate. What's, what's really interesting to me that, and this is probably just a good note to close on, but what's really interesting to me is just how so many of these technologies came up in the wake of testing limitations or testing costs, you know, ways to get around spending money running the car. And in the end, the car ends up being the way to validate that these, these methods, which are ultimately more expensive than running the car itself, but just more valuable pieces of information and a more valuable way to get those pieces of information. You know, the car ends up being just, well, we're going to go run it. And naturally, because of how motorsport works, how racing works, how people in cars and, you know, the red mist and making poor, good decisions, bad decisions, chance, force majeure, all of it. You never quite know what's going to happen when you actually run the thing in a, in a group full of other idiots running the thing. But the notion that it started off in one direction and is now something else entirely and way more valuable than anybody could have imagined is really cool. But yeah, yeah the, uh, the current wind tunnel is in a computer. <laughs> it's CFD. I mean, and, and there's a lot of digital ketchup. <laughs> it is large tubes they and actually, digital ketchup. They what was the deal? I, I don't know what it was, but you know, they limited, like you said, Sam, just now testing yeah. days. Right? You can only test how many whatever the days are in all every up and series. down the sport. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Because we're gonna reduce costs. Well, right. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know. I've always said race budgets aren't about how much things cost. Race budgets are determined by what's available to spend. <laughs> That's the race budget. So I will tell my have... wife that and she will be very happy. <laughs> <laughs> it's, but it's true. Yeah. I mean, right. if they say, okay, you can only test on the track eight days. Yeah. Well, oh, we're going to save. $5 million because we're not going to test much anymore. Heck no. We're going to spend that on simulation, CFD, shaker rigs, <laughs> anything we can. We're going to spend the 5 million. We're just not yeah. going to spend it on track days because they won't <laughs> let us. So <laughs> then formula one came in and I don't know all the details here, but they actually limited formula one teams to the number. First, I think it was hours of wind tunnel of CFD time. They could only run their computers right. for so much time. So then yeah. what the teams did is went and bought faster computers so they could do more work in <laughs> the same amount of time. And then Formula One said, no, 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 we're going to limit you to the number of whatever the, the unit is, teraflops of right, right. bits <laughs> going through your computer. And I think that's how Formula One is limited. You can only do CFD for a certain number of teraflops of data that you can run through your computers nowadays. I love, I love the absurdity of a sport where, A, it's just going around in circles. That's all it is at the base of it. And yet, you know, like F1, we, you, you and I and Ross were talking about this a long time ago. I don't remember if it was on the air or not. Think about like the, um, the beryllium piston era when they were told that they couldn't use these things with this toxic, they couldn't make engines with a toxic material in them anymore because it was literally <laughs> going to kill people and it was bad. And they were like, well, wait, why? <laughs> why? Well, it, was, it wasn't that they didn't care about the cost. They didn't care about the people. They were just like, but mm, that's not a good enough reason. Um, right. it's, it's really good. We use the thing and it's really good. Just the notion that's that right. the entire machine is just set up to just figure out more ways to throw money down the disposal that is driving around in circles. I, that's I it. love it. But that's on it. that note, 
we uh, we're we're about out of time. That's our show. If you get a chance, check out uh, Jeff and Paul Haney's book, which again I read and really enjoyed. It's called Inside Racing Technology. It's great, even or you know, basically, especially if you're not a tech person. A lot of really cool stuff explained in layman term, layman's terms. It's out of print, but available used online really affordably through Amazon or AbeBooks.com or any of the others. I think I might have paid like nine dollars for mine plus shipping. Uh, tune in next week. All three of us will be here. Me, Ross, and Jeff. Our topic will be, uh, what is it? Uh, Ross and Jeff talking about that time that the two of them discovered and busted wide open this underground crime ring in a dark city with a heart of gold. But Ross was this by the book cop who believed in doing everything by the rules. And, you know, he's getting a little too old for this. Well, Jeff, you know, Jeff, he was a streetwise detective whose unorthodox methods tended to ruffle feathers, but he always got his man. And that's basically how they became unlikely friends and citywide heroes. And uh, it was a good story. But uh, that's our show. See you next time. Thanks, Jeff. And thanks for listening. Have fun. (laughs) Ketchup.